Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second session of this RSET training titled Introduction to Synthetic Aperture Radar and its Applications. I'm Dr. Erica Potis. I'm a scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and also an instructor with the RSET program. Today's session will be an introduction to INSAR, Interferometric SAR, which will be delivered by invited expert Dr. Eric Fielding, who's also a scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Prior knowledge for today's session is the basics of synthetic aperture radar and SAR processing and data analysis. And here's the training outline. The third and last session of this webinar series will be next Wednesday. Uh, November 20th, and that will be an overview of SAR data sources and tools. I'd like to remind everyone that there is a homework associated with this webinar series. It will open on the last day of the series, so that's on November 20th, and the due date will be on December 4th. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those participants who attend all three of the live sessions and complete the homework assignment by the due date. How to ask questions. Please write your questions in the questions box, which is at the bottom right. You'll have, there'll be three points. Click on that and there'll be a pop-up menu. Select questions and write your questions in that box. And we will address your questions at the end of this session. Feel free to enter your questions as we go along. And we'll try to get to all of your questions during the Q&A session, the remaining questions that we cannot answer, we will answer them in the Q&A document, which we will post to the training website in about a week. So now let's get started with this uh, session introduction to INSAR. The learning objectives for today's session are the following identify key concepts of the physics of SAR interferometry, recognize what SAR interferometric phase says about the land surface, identify the data processing steps needed to generate a SAR interferogram, be able to interpret the information content in SAR interferometric images to measure deformation, and finally, identify application areas in which interferometric SAR is useful. Dr. Eric Fielding is a research scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He's a geophysicist and expert in the use of radar interferometry for studying tectonic movements, landslides, and other phenomena. Dr. Fielding is also part of the NISAR science team, which is a satellite radar mission that will be launched in early 2025. He is a globally recognized expert in the use of INSAR and has supported nearly all of the INSAR sessions that RSET has offered. And I believe this is his fourth or fifth participation in an RSET training. I'm extremely grateful for his involvement as a guest instructor in this training. Thank you very much and welcome back, Dr. Fielding. Well, thank you, Erica, for uh, introducing this uh, training today. Uh, I'll be talking about SAR interferometry and starting off with a discussion of the base, some of the basic theory about SAR interferometry. Uh, the previous uh, sessions, uh, uh, Erica has described what uh, synthetic aperture radar or SAR is. I won't cover that. Um, I hope that you've uh, seen her presentation to understand what SAR is. And what I'm going to be talking about is the uh, method of interferometry that uses the uh, coherent nature of the uh, SAR images to uh, be able to make uh, measurements of very small uh, displacements of the ground surface. <clears throat> So uh, over here on the uh, on the left here, uh, we have uh, the radar beam coming in as shown by this line. Uh, we think about it as a 
uh, a wave that's propagating with a, 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 li a linear phase front. Uh, and that phase uh, radar, uh, incoming radar beam signal uh, interacts with a number of objects that are within uh, a radar uh, resolution element, uh, which is the radar pixel. Uh, and then so uh, on the left is one one pixel in the image, and another on the right is another pixel. You can see that the 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 things that reflect the radar within inside, inside that pixel are in different locations in every in every pixel, and that's um, means that when we add together the phase of uh, the the return reflected beam from each one of these objects in within the pixel we get a, a total phase that uh, ends up being um, a, a, a complicated uh, sum of all the internal the things inside the pixel um, and so uh, that's the phase that's due to the pixel or, or the scatterers that are within the pixel and then there's another part of the phase that's the range or the the total distance between uh, the satellite antenna and the uh, ground surface. Uh, and that's the range phase. So um, we do, uh, so there's actually millions of cycles of the radar uh, uh, radar signal, uh, but in the hundreds of kilometers of um, between the the radar uh, in space and and the ground. Uh, so we can't actually count the total number of, of cycles. Um, so that is one of the uh, things to remember with uh, SAR interferometry is that we can't, um, uh, we don't know the exact uh, distance to the ground. We know, but by uh, taking uh, the interferometric difference, uh, we're going to be able to uh, tell changes in the distance, even if we don't know the total distance exactly. Um, and because this, uh, this wave is repeating, then, uh, we, we only, um, we, we, we measure the phase of the signal, which is where it is in this, uh, up and down curve. Uh, and that'll be important, um, uh, later. We just don't know how many times the, the curve has gone up and down between the satellite and the ground surface. So uh, the phase that we measure is uh, from one, the key thing is that we're gonna use two different images or two different radar images, either taken from two different antennas at the same time or the same antenna at two different times. Uh, and uh, this, these equations work for both of those situations. Uh, we have this uh, term that depends on the distance. The row here uh, is the distance. Uh, and that's uh, divided by the uh, radar wavelength, oh, 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 4 pi over the radar wavelength. That's the uh, total uh, delay uh, of the radar propagation from the satellite antenna to the ground and then back up to the satellite. Then there's these other constants, which are due to that distribution of the scatterers within that pixel. And then there's some uh, amount of noise here, the N1 for, for image one and the N2 for image two. But the key thing here is that um, this other constants part of the pixel, uh, of a given pixel is, uh, can be close to cons uh, the same for the two images. Um, and that's the key to doing interferometry is that by taking the difference between these the phase of image one and image two, we cancel out these other constants and therefore get the uh, total distance uh, or the difference in the total distance uh, here, row, but the difference between row one and row two. Uh, as I mentioned, there's two different, basically a couple different ways to do interferometry. Uh, there's the interferometry where <clears throat> we have two antennas at the, uh, 
um, on, on either on uh, satellites flying together, uh, the, the German satellite system called Ter Tandem X had two has two radar satellites that fly uh, through space very close together so that they can image the ground uh, at the same time. We also did a shuttle radar topography mission, which is a NASA mission where we actually had a 60 meter long boom uh, in the, coming out of the radar, the NASA space shuttle uh, payload bay to separate uh, one antenna uh, the, at the end of the boom from the main antenna at, inside the payload bay. So there, that's how we did a topographic map of most of the world in uh, 10 days by using that uh, radar system with the two antennas. So that's uh, that's uh, single pass interferometry where we have two different antennas. Then there's the uh, there's still a, another case of having the uh, uh, the two antennas separated in space uh, across the uh, perpendicular to the flight direction uh, is the case where we have one antenna. Uh, on the satellite, but the satellite comes back again on a different day uh, and, and repeats the same pass over the ground. Um, and those that second pass often is never exactly in the same point in space. They try to keep it as close as possible, but it does have some distance between the the, the passes. But in that case, then these two antenna locations are on the two different dates uh, rather than on the, uh, at, and that's called repeat pass interferometry. There's also a type of interferometry uh, where they take two images as the satellites passing over the area, um, just a few um, uh, milliseconds apart, and then they can do uh, interferometry between these two uh, images uh, acquired just a, a short time apart and that as a way of measuring uh, wave motion. Uh, uh, the, the radial part of the wave motion. Uh, so uh, as I uh, mentioned that with the, uh, the single pass interferometry where we had the two antennas uh, or on uh, either on the space shuttle or on uh, two different satellites close together, uh, that allows us to measure topo topographic maps uh, because the, uh, I'll, be told, I'll talk about that in, in a minute, how we do that, but uh, it's a way of measuring uh, very high resolution topographic maps. Um, the um, topographic map from shuttle radar topography mission had a, uh, a spacing of about 30 meters. Uh, the the Tandem X uh, from uh, the German Space Agency and uh, Airbus uh, has a spacing around 10 meters. Uh, so uh, you can get, ver I mean, it's not super high resolution compared to uh, what you get from LIDAR, but you can cover very large areas. Um, and in fact, uh, the, the Tandem XDEM, uh, which was uh, commercially processed by uh, Airbus, uh, then was uh, purchased by uh, the European Copernicus mission, uh, Copernicus project, and ma made available now publicly at uh, 30 meter resolution globally as the Copernicus DEM. Um, so if you want the 10 meter DEM, I guess you have to buy it from from Airbus, but the 30 meter uh, version that we use for many other things uh, is is available from uh, Copernicus uh, and it's freely available online. So this is a, a excellent way of covering large areas um, at, uh, at pretty high resolution. There's also an airborne version of this uh, that's been operated by a number of groups, including NASA. NASA has an airborne radar system that's called um, GLSEN. <clears throat> the other uh, main interferometry uh, is that repeat pass interferometry where we have the two different dates. Um, uh, in satellites, uh, the dates are normally uh, 
uh, at least a day apart and often many, many days apart. Uh, the, there are some airborne systems where they've uh, been able to repeat uh, the track uh, just a few hours apart or, or even uh, tens of minutes uh, to see changes over very short periods of time. But the uh, key thing is that uh, this is a way uh, to measure the amount of displacement of the ground or at least the um, objects above the ground like buildings or trees or uh, bridges, uh, whatever is reflecting the radar uh, during the time interval between the two dates. So uh, we'll talk about more, that more later. So those are the two uh, main types of interferometry uh, that are in wide use. So the uh, this is a, a simple diagram to ex uh, explain how we measure topography with the uh, the two antennas and the uh, single pass. Uh, so we have uh, an image acquired. This is a uh, like a cross section where the the satellite's moving into the screen here uh, at uh, uh, location of uh, point A one and, and A two. Uh, on two different uh, at the same time or, or very close to the same time, uh, and by looking at the um, the phase uh, at these two locations uh, separated by some distance, a distance b for baseline, uh, and we know this how that baseline is oriented in space, where the where the satellite orbit is, uh, we can estimate the uh, change in uh, distance between the two uh, <clears throat> the two radar images acquired at the two locations and that's then proportional to the um, the height here of uh, uh, z of the ground surface or ground or whatever else is reflecting the radar above the um, some reference uh, surface like sea level uh, or, or an ellipsoid. And that's proportional to this, um, uh, do this triangulation uh, calculation of, with these different triangles. Uh, the, uh, uh, Z here is the uh, elevation above the, uh, the reference surface. And uh, that's what we finally get. Uh, this equation ends up uh, being um, we, that we need to know the uh, distance between these two antenna locations to a few millimeters, um, and then uh, the and the orientation. Uh, the shuttle radar topography mission had a whole sophisticated system to measure the orientation of that baseline. The distance was also measured carefully. Uh, you, and then uh, we can then convert that to uh, the height uh, using these equations. Uh, this is uh, th there's a little bit of a difference depending on whether the uh, whether with the space shuttle uh, uh, we had basically all the uh, radar energy was uh, sent out by the uh, antenna inside the space shuttle payload bay and then came to the ground and they recorded it when it came back inside the payload bay and at the uh, antenna at the end of the boom that's what we call classic with tandem x they actually had two satellites uh so the, the this uh, second antenna is a second satellite and there they can do uh, what we call ping pong mode where each satellite sends its own signal down to the ground and receives it it, it just changes the equation by adding an extra factor of two here, uh, which I'm not going to go into um, in great detail. Uh, and then uh, as for the repeat pass um, acquisitions, then we have uh, the radar uh, on the space shuttle or, or, or whatever other satellite um, <clears throat> coming by at two different times. And that uh, is, again, a little bit more, more like that ping pong mode where uh, at each time there's the, the uh, satellite sends out the signal to the ground 
So that's where this two comes into these equations here uh, uh, on the uh, getting the phase from the uh, change in range. Uh, so for uh, measuring uh, displacements, um, the range, the difference in the range between time one and time two is uh, a direct measurement of the uh, change in, in distance between the, uh, the, the two antennas and the ground. If the two antennas were if they manage to fly the spacecraft so to, to exactly the same point, then we uh, would all be able to see just the uh, the distance change uh, the, uh, and the um, distance change here, uh, delta rho uh, in uh, millimeters or whatever, um, multiplied by four pi over pi uh, over the lambda. Lambda is the radar wavelength. Tells us that we get a, a, a high sensitivity to the um, change um, depending on the radar wavelength. In a, a real case, then the uh, the two antennas are not in exactly the same place in, in space, uh, either at two, at two different times or, or with the uh, single pass. Then uh, there's uh, an additional range change that's due to topography um, and so there's a that's proportional to the elevation of the ground surface at a given pixel uh, and then there's a change term and those two are added together uh, so <clears throat> if you want to measure topography then you want to have the two images at the same time where where the change term is zero because it had there's no time chain uh, between the two images, uh, or if we want to measure the uh, change between two different times, then we have to uh, know what the topography is. So that's why uh, we are are so um, interested and in, in actually dependent on getting that digital elevation model data from. Uh, SRTM or the Tandem X Copernicus DEM uh, because we need to know what the topography is uh, and uh, subtract that out in order to be able to measure the change term. And then these are the uh, sensitivities to uh, topography and to uh, displacement. As I mentioned earlier, the uh, sensitivity to displacement is, is 4 pi over lambda, the, the radar wavelength. Um, so if we're very sensitive to um, displacements. Uh, the sensitivity to uh, topography depends on a rho here, which is the total distance uh, between the satellite and the ground, which is hundreds of kilometers. Uh, and the, the baseline here, uh, or perpendicular component of the baseline here on the numerator is only uh, 50, 100 meters. Uh, so because we're dividing this 100, 100 meters by hundreds of kilometers or hundreds of thousands of meters, uh, we're much less sensitive to topography than to um, uh, to displacements. So basically we can measure topography around uh, uh, the meter scale uh, and the topographic change or, or dis surface displacements at the millimeter scale. So that's a key thing to keep in mind. Uh, what's the difference between the single pass interferometry uh, for topography and the uh, repeat pass interferometry for displacements? So they have very different sensitivities. <clears throat> One of the other um, e, uh, details about uh, interferometry uh, that I mentioned briefly earlier is that we measure the phase, which is where uh, the um, the radar signal is on this um, sine wave, um, but the sine waves are repeating. Uh, so we don't know how many of these sine waves there are in any one place. We just know where, where we are within this uh, cycle. Uh, so the 
the actual measurement that we get here is this middle line. Uh, it's what we get a, a what's called a wrapped phase. That means every between uh, every two pi of phase uh, in, measured in radians, uh, the signal uh, is wrapped around or repeated. And that means that uh, we get measurements that look like this uh, sawtooth uh, measurement between pi, minus pi and plus pi. Uh, and we have to use a computer program to try to figure out how many uh, factors of two pi uh, are, need to be added to the phase at any one point. So if the actual phase uh, here is on the top, uh, after we do the interferometry, we end up with this wrap phase where it's modulo two pi. We need to figure out how many two pi's we need to add, it, which which parts of the image, and we get this unwrapped phase if uh, if we're uh, if it's not too noisy. <clears throat> so another uh, key factor uh, um, aspect of the interferometric phase is what we call the uh, interferometric coherence or intermetric interferometric correlation. Um, some people uh, call this the correlation because uh, we actually use uh, spatial correlation or, or temporal uh, correlation between the, the radar signals uh, to estimate the coherence. Um, a lot of people nowadays are using the term coherence uh, more uh, is 10 years ago or 20 years ago, people were calling it correlation more often. Now people are more, more likely to call it coherence. Uh, but you'll, you, you may hear either one of these terms, the interferometric correlation or interferometric coherence. And uh, basically it's the same thing, just with a different name. Uh, so the, uh, <clears throat> the radar signals can uh, become incoherent or, or lose or, or decorrelate um, for a variety of reasons, there could be some um, just errors in the radar processor or, and, th and the temperature in the system. That's the thermal noise. That's usually very small. Uh, if the baseline uh, or distance between the two uh, satellite positions is large, uh, that causes what we call a volumetric uh, decorrelation uh, and, and geometric decorrelation. Uh, if the, for some reason, the two radar uh, antennas are, are looking at different directions, that causes a loss of coherence. And then there's the other big effect, which is the uh, motion of those objects within the radar pixel. And, and that we'll talk about that uh, in a minute. Uh, uh, <clears throat> And once we have this amount of uh, loss of coherence or, or decorrelation, that um, can be related to uh, an estimate of the, fa the deviation, uh, phase standard deviation, uh, standard deviation of the phase. And that affects how accurately we can estimate the height or displacement. And it affects the, um, the phase unwrapping process because uh, if there's too much noise, the computer can make mistakes in, in what, uh, what number of 2 pi to add. And the key, a key thing to remember about the correlation or coherence components is that these components are not added together like uh, the topographic phase and the uh, displacement phase, but they're multiplied together. So that means that if any one of these uh, effects like the volumetric uh, eff uh, effect of trees or the steep slopes or um, uh, gradual changes in the surface or sudden changes due to uh, earthquake or volcano or, or whatever uh, hurricane hitting. Uh, any one of these being low will cause uh, the total uh, coherence or, or correlation to be low. So. Uh, one of the challenges if you're trying to use uh, this method to look at a signal is to be able to separate uh, what part of the de the loss of coherence or decorrelation is due to which one of these effects because they're multiplied together. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm going to talk about some uh, applications. Uh, these are just some general examples. 
uh, some of these examples are, are a few years old, but um, the use of INSAR has uh, really expanded drastically in, in the last years. Uh, so uh, have, I won't attempt to, to do a comprehensive uh, review of all the um, all the applications. So uh, these are some examples of deformation. Um, on the top left here uh, is the interferometric fringes from uh, an earthquake from 1999 in Southern California. It was called the Hector Mine earthquake. Uh, it was one of the first earthquakes that was uh, well covered uh, by the European uh, radar satellite ERS-1 and ERS-2. Uh, <clears throat> in the middle here uh, is an example of uh, interferometry showing uh, subsidence of the ground surface uh, uh, due to uh, extraction of groundwater uh, in law in this is in the city of Pomona, this uh, east of Los Angeles, uh, at where they were extracting a lot of groundwater uh, back in, uh, this is from uh, the early 90s. Uh, and that showed up as a very clear signal in the uh, INSAR data. Uh, this has uh, now been found many places around the world uh, in, uh, in with very, rapid rates in certain places, uh, including uh, the Central Valley of California, uh, Mexico City, uh, places in Iran, places in uh, India, many, many places around the world uh, where they extract large amounts of groundwater, the, the ground surface uh, is subsiding. <clears throat> Another example here uh, on the upper right is a, a volcano that was in um, in Sicily uh, called Mount Etna, and that uh, volcano uh, it goes up and down uh, quite often uh, due to uh, the magma uh, moving in into the magma chamber underneath the volcano. Uh, uh, scientists have been studying that for more than uh, 20 years now. Uh, so we have a very uh, complete uh, time history of what what the surface of that volcano has been doing for, for more than 20 years uh, with from SAR interferometry. So one of the other, and another uh, big uh, application of uh, SAR interferometry is to measure the motion of ice. And this is an example from the, uh, uh, the coast of Greenland, uh, where there's some um, ice streams, uh, the large Greenland ice cap has, is generally uh, a flat surface, but then where it gets close to the uh, coast, uh, that some there's some streams or, or kind of like a river in the ice where the, the uh, velocity of the ice is much higher than, than adjacent areas. It's like a, a river of ice. And we can measure that motion with the SAR interferometry method. Uh, these are uh, some examples of volcanoes in uh, the Andes that were uh, uh, measured uh, some years ago by Matt Pritchard, who is now professor at Cornell. Uh, he found uh, a number of these uh, volcanoes in the Andes had uh, significant signals. Do, we don't uh, always know whether that's uh, due to magma motion and at depth or it's a more shallower effect that's due to uh, hydrothermal uh, fluid uh, variations. So uh, people have been using SAR interferometry for a long time to monitor this over, over decades to see what each one of these volcanoes is doing. Uh, so that's been a, a, a long a, a key application of uh, SAR interferometry. And it works especially well in the Andes because the Andes, the high part of the Andes is uh, uh, free of vegetation. So we can see the what the volcanoes are doing. This is another uh, case. Uh, this is a volcanic uh, dike injection in a far area of uh, Ethiopia. There was a huge um, dike 
that uh, intruded into the uh, ground surface and forced the uh, ground apart. Uh, it caused this huge uh, valley to form. Uh, and uh, with interferometry, we can see that this this line here is where the that valley opened up, and all these uh, fringes or, or um, interferometric con contours show how much the the ground surface moved apart uh, due to that uh, magma moving into a dike uh, below the surface. And they, the two sides of the of the dike moved apart by as much as five meters in, in some places. <clears throat> this is an earthquake that happened in uh, 2015 in uh, Nepal. Uh, the uh, seismologists call it the Gorkha earthquake because the, the epicenter of the earthquake was near the Nepalese city of Gorkha. Uh, but uh, there was de uh, the once we had the interferometry, uh, we were able to see this pattern here, which shows the uh, uh, displacement of the ground surface uh, due to the earthquake. Um, in this case, the radar line of sight is almost uh, uh, perpendicular to the direction that the earthquake moved. These uh, arrows show the uh, GPS stations that moved uh, and displaced the ground, uh, show that the uh, ground moved uh, south, south, southwest, uh, which is basically perpendicular to the line of sight here. So that means that we're not, we're not seeing this uh, horizontal motion uh, to the southwest, but we're, what we are seeing is the vertical motion that's a, a secondary part of this earthquake deformation. So, in fact, the, the city of Kathmandu here is in the area that where the ground surface was pushed upward by the earthquake. Uh, uh, up, uh, and the uplift due to the earthquake was as much as uh, 1.2 meters. And that the area to the north uh, was, uh, was dropped down by the earthquake because it, uh, the ground surface was, the, the fault was pulling material away. So, we did a, a study of this uh, some years ago. Uh, I mentioned it's uh, this UA et al. Uh, paper uh, using this interferometry, the GPS, and seismological me seismometer measurements. Uh, we were able to reconstruct the whole uh, slip on the earthquake fault as a function of time during the earthquake. Uh, the interferometry was a key part of that. We can also look at faults such as uh, the central part of the San Andreas Fault. Um, this is a, a, a less populated part of California, uh, the central coast ranges between uh, the very tiny town of uh, Parkfield and uh, San Juan Batista. And this is the, the San Andreas Fault passes through this area. And it act, this part of the San Andreas Fault actually moves uh, gradually all the time. Um, there are earthquakes here um, uh, up to about magnitude four, four and a half, but uh, because uh, it seems to be moving all the time, we think that this section of the San Andreas Fault uh, never uh, participates in large earthquakes because the this uh, gradual motion that occurs over time uh, releases all the, the stress that's building up. Uh, that's uh, unusual, but there are other places around the world, including the, the Hayward Fault in, in uh, Northern California, that do the same kind of uh, gradual uh, creep. And it's very uh, uh, clearly shown on these interfer interferograms. Uh, we uh, mentioned earlier about groundwater extraction in Pomona. This is another example uh, from the city of Las Vegas. Um, this was uh, published uh, 20 years ago. So uh, I think the uh, ex groundwater extraction in Las Vegas probably increased since then. <laughs> uh, the city uh, population has increased drastically in the last 20 years. Uh, and we can also see that uh, not only is the, uh, <clears throat> the, there are a lot of variation in the, um, 
uh, the amount of subsidence in different places, but some of the the subsidence is is controlled by faults, uh, and that means it's probably because the fault uh, is uh, um, truncating the um, the layer that has the water in it. This is another example of um, ice stream velocities in Antarctica. Uh, and these were um, actually mapped by uh, uh, INSAR and uh, another technique called feature tracking. We don't have time to cover today. Uh, it's a way to measure very large displacements. And then this is just another uh, an example of um, uh, groundwater. Um, I mean, this is not groundwater, but this is uh, due to oil extraction uh, in Argentina. Uh, these these. Uh, Areas here are areas where the oil is being extracted more quickly, and and that's causing some the surface to move down a few centimeters in, in just a, a few, two years. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we can also look at decorrelation or, or uh, coherence loss uh, to um, look at how the ground surface has changed uh, between two dates. Uh, this is. Uh, a map of the coherence, not the not the in interferometric phase, but the interferometric coherence or, or correlation, uh, with uh, the lower correlation in these uh, green and yellow colors, and higher correlation or coherence in the red colors. We can see uh, this area around the city of Bam, uh, which had the, a devastating earthquake in 2003. Uh, the adjacent uh, desert areas or have very high coherence. Um, it's a desert pavement that did not change at all in the 35 days. The city of BAM here uh, was um, has very low coherence. Um, and there's a line of low coherence right along uh, this area to the south. And that um, turned out to be uh, where the fault uh, that ruptured in this 2003 earthquake came to the surface. Uh, the geologist had no idea that this fault was here. It was uh, not a, a previously mapped fault. There was a previously mapped fault over here near the city of Baravant. Uh, they went out here and they looked at this uh, previously mapped fault. They did not find anything uh, at the surface uh, showing a significant slip on the on that fault but they once we sent them this interfer uh, interferometric coherence map uh, the, uh, with this very uh, sharp line of uh, irregular line going to the south of the city they went out into the desert here and found that there were uh, clear fault ruptures at the surface with up to 25 centimeters of slip uh, so this is an excellent example of where we use that interferometric coherence change to actually map uh, something about what changed in that 35 days. So you'll notice that the city of BAM and the city of Baravat both have low coherence uh, in this 35 day interval. Um, and that's uh, because um, uh, a combination of what has both the, um, vegetation effects and the damage to the buildings. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we can do is take uh, two in, two interferometric coherence maps and subtract them. Uh, so we look at the interferometric coherence before the earthquake and subtract that from the interferometric coherence of the pair that includes the earthquake. And that gives us um, an estimate of what uh, part of the coherence uh, low coherence is due to the earthquake, and that sh uh, highlights the fact that the city of BAM uh, is widely damaged by uh, with huge numbers of buildings that were destroyed, whereas the city of Baravant had low coherence due to uh, vegetation, uh, date plantations before the earthquake and during the earthquake. But uh, by doing this difference, we, we subtract that out and uh, see that the damage is here in BAM and the, and the Baravant uh, part is not damaged. We can also see that very clearly the, um, the fault rupture to the south of the city of BAM. 
And this uh, method of taking the coherence difference has been developed into what we now call the damage proxy maps, uh, which we use to uh, map damage uh, due to earthquakes, uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, landslides, and, and many other effects uh, based on, on this method. And that's, that's where the earthquake ruptured. <clears throat> we can also use um, airborne uh, interferometric direct systems. Uh, NASA has this uh, airborne a special airplane. Uh, uh, it's a piloted plane, uh, but we, the radar system is called UAVSAR. It's actually flying on a piloted plane um, operated by NASA pilots. And we can fly this in different directions over, uh, this is a landslide in Colorado that moves very quickly. Uh, and by taking the, uh, the uh, interferograms from different directions, we're able to estimate what's the, uh, the motion, the full three-dimensional motion of the ground surface uh, in, the, in this uh, map. I uh, don't have time to go into that in great detail, but that's a, by having the three-dimensional surface deformation, we can actually estimate what depth the uh, landslide is sliding and we've been doing that uh, a lot uh, in the last years um, with this method. So um, I'd like to uh, now talk about the uh, NASA satellite mission that's uh, upcoming. Uh, it, this is a joint uh, mission with the uh, Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO. Uh, we, we, it's called the uh, NASA ISRO SAR mission. Uh, or NISAR for short, and we're really looking forward to this uh, launching early next year. The um, uh, radar, the, it's a uh, the system is uh, basically uh, ready to go. Uh, the they're just doing some final uh, tests and then uh, getting ready to put it on uh, a rocket. It's going to be launched by uh, an ISRO rocket. That's one of their big contributions uh, to this mission. Uh, so we're we're waiting for ISRO to decide exactly when the the the, the rocket will be ready, uh, but it'll be early next year. Uh, and the uh, all the data will be available uh, free and open to everybody uh, and. That we have this website, nisar.jpl.nasa.gov, for more information. This is some more details about the uh, NISAR satellite. We're going to have this 240-kilometer uh, swath. We're using a method called SWEEPSAR, uh, but taking advantage of, of this reflector system. Uh, the radar uh, is emitted from a bunch of uh, transmit receive modules along the top of the satellite, goes up to the reflector, goes down to the ground, comes back. And by uh, receiving the data at a, a number of these reflectors at different times, we're able to image this whole swath here uh, uh, with a, a pretty, with consistent coverage that gives us um, uh, this is a new technique that has not uh, yet been flown in space called, that we call SWEEPSAR. Uh, it's going to be fly at an altitude of 747 kilometers uh, at the near, uh, the closer part of the satellite or near range. It's going to have an incidence angle from the vertical of 33 degrees and go out to 47 degrees. Um, the orbit's going to be in a 6 a.m., 6 p.m. orbit. So at any given place on the ground, it come over around 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. As it goes around the Earth, it goes over each place. Uh, it goes over the Earth twice, both on the uh, uh, ascending or north or, and descending, going or the satellite's going south. The main radar wavelength is 24 centimeters. Uh, that gives us uh, uh, a longer radar wavelength that's less sensitive to that uh, decorrelation in, in vegetation. That um, BAM earthquake that I showed you uh, was using uh, a shorter radar wavelength, about five, six centimeters, and that's why it was much more sensitive to that uh, vegetation in the 
<clears throat> town of Baravant. Uh, the L band interferometry will be uh, uh, coherent over vegetated areas around the world. Um, so that that's going to give us uh, interferometry coverage in a lot of places that are not presently well covered. Uh, so the L band instrument was built by uh, JPL and uh, NASA. And then there's a second uh, radar instrument. In fact, there's there's two different uh, sets of uh, radar transmitters here using the same end, uh, reflector. And that this is a, a radar wavelength called S-band, and it has a 9.4 centimeter wavelength, a little less than half of the, uh, the radar wavelength that we're using uh, for the L-band, uh, the L-band for the, uh, the NASA part. Uh, the S-band data has a, a more limited capacity. They can't cover the whole world. Uh, so they're mainly going to cover uh, the Indian subcontinent and certain other parts of the world, uh, Indonesia and, and a few other places. Uh, but in, in, in those areas, we'll actually have two different radar wavelengths, and that'll give additional information, especially about uh, vegetation, uh, vegetation structure. <clears throat> it's a 12-day exact repeat. That's the same as um, Sentinel-1. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about later. Uh, we have uh, three different, uh, uh, several different modes. The main ones uh, have a th between uh, 10 uh, meters uh, resolution and uh, three meters resolution. The satellite uh, NASA has certain categories of satellites. This is in the category that's uh, uh, expected to last at least three years, um, as far as NASA goes. And but ISRO has uh, plans uh, by their definition, the, the mission is expected to last for five years. And ISRO is also putting enough fuel on the satellite to last uh, probably at least 10 years if, if everything is going well. Um, the big uh, thing is that it has this very high observation duty cycle. Uh, we can get up to, to operate over. As it comes over the Earth, it can operate as much as 50% of the orbit and get all that data down to the ground. This is uh, going to be the highest volume data uh, satellite that's been launched uh, so far. Um, NASA built some extra ground receiving stations just to be able to get all the data down to the ground. Um, the satellite is going to be looking towards the south or left looking as it, along the satellite track. That means it's going to get better coverage of Antarctica and uh, less coverage here in uh, the Arctic. You can see that the very northern end of um, Greenland is, is not covered. Uh, also Svalbard and, and a few other places. Uh, and the Arctic Ocean. Um, we expect that other satellites like Sentinel-1, RadarSat, and uh, other will cover the Arctic, and we're not going to be covering the Arctic with NISAR. <clears throat> so now I'm going to talk about uh, INSAR processing. Uh, for this uh, introductory course, we're not going to get into uh, a lot of details. Uh, we're going to uh, use some of the new uh, uh, products that are available um, to uh, simplify the radar processing. Uh, we're going to be using data from the uh, Copernicus Sentinel-1 uh, satellite system. Uh, Sentinel-1 is actually a constellation of satellites. Uh, they launched the first Sentinel-1 in, uh, uh, in 2014. Uh, they Sentinel-1A was launched in April of 2014, but it actually started regular operations in October of 2014. Uh, they uh, then launched uh, Sentinel-1B, the second uh, Sentinel-1 satellite in uh, 2016, and got that into operations within 2016. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, Sentinel-1B satellite had some kind of uh, onboard anomaly in the radar system, and it stopped working in uh, December of 2021. So 
uh, we had the two satellites operating at the same time for about five years. Uh, but since in the last three years, uh, we only have, uh, we're back to having one satellite. Um, each one of the satellites uh, operates in a 12 day repeating orbit. Um, they flew Sentinel 1A and, and 1B in orbits such that the, they covered a given point on the ground six days apart. So that uh, made it effectively a, a six day repeat. The two satellites were identical uh, in the radar system, so they could be used for full, uh, completely interchangeably for interferometry and, and other types of analysis. Um, Sentinel 1C uh, is, is ready for launch. They just announced last week that uh, they're planning to launch it on December 3rd uh, of 2024. So that's coming up right away very soon. Uh, and so they'll uh, have Sentinel 1C in replacing uh, Sentinel 1B, and they'll go back to the uh, six day uh, time between Sentinel 1A and, and 1C. And they also have uh, uh, Sentinel 1D uh, already uh, built and uh, almost ready to be launched. So I think the the plan is to to launch Sentinel 1C, uh, B D, the fourth one, uh, maybe six months after 1C because uh, Sentinel 1A uh, has now been in space for 10 years and it was designed to. Uh, to last for seven years, and it's, so it's getting uh, it's getting a little bit uh, a little bit old and, and having some some issues. So they want to get uh, Sentinel One D C and D uh, launched uh, very as soon as possible, and uh, it looks like they're going to be doing that very soon. The Sentinel One uh, satellites uh, all use the same. Um, the same acquisition modes. Um, there are a few places where they they use different modes, but especially over the oceans. Uh, but for over almost all the land on the Earth, um, they use this uh, mode that's called TOPS, uh, which stands for Terrain Observation by Progressive Scans. Um, kind of a funny name, but. Um, uh, it's a way to uh, to image a, a wide swath. Um, unlike NISAR, which has this uh, sweep SAR that images the whole swath continuously, um, Sentinel One uh, has three different sub swaths. So uh, the satellite sends out pulses uh, of the radar um, uh, for uh, some amount of time in one subswath, then it switches the beam and sends out a, a burst of uh, radar pulses in a different subswath for a while. And then it switches the beam and sends out pulses uh, in, in the third subswath for a while. Then it, then it switches back to the, the first one. Uh, and over time, it builds up a, an image uh, over the full 250 kilometer wide swath out of these three sub swaths with a, a, a number of bursts along track uh, that uh, are, are separated uh, by some amount of time as the, as the satellite's moving along. Um, so the fundamental um, uh, component that in, in the way they process the data um, uh, the Sentinel uh, satellites are owned uh, and paid for by uh, the European Union uh, through their Copernicus program, but the European Union then uh, hires the European Space Agency uh, to do the uh, building and operation of the satellites. So it's kind of a, a little bit uh, uh, strange uh, for us uh, out in the United States uh, arrangement between two different organizations that the countries that are in the European Union are different from the countries that are in the European Space Agency. So they're not exactly the same uh, 
groups, but the money, so the money comes from the European Union, but the, the work is done by the European Space Agency. And they, uh, they ask us to, to call it the Copernicus uh, Sentinel-1 satellites and not the ESA Sentinel-1 satellites because they are, they're paid for by Copernicus. Um, but ESA does the, the operation and data processing. So um, they process the data in these bursts uh, and each burst is about 20 kilometers along along the radar track and 90 kilometers uh, wide. They overlap some between the three subswaths to give the full swath width, 250 kilometers. And the, uh, the bursts overlap a long track by uh, just about three kilometers, a very small amount. Um, so it's kind of a complicated system. Uh, but it uh, was the choice that they made uh, uh, quite a while ago. Uh, obviously, it's the, the first one was launched 10 years ago, so this was designed uh, probably about 15 years ago or more uh, to give a, 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 a good uh, coverage uh, with a uniform uh, radar amplitude um but it does cause some uh, issues for uh, interferometry uh, which we've learned how to deal with but it, it does make things a little bit more difficult uh, <clears throat> there are uh, some higher level uh products um, so the preliminary processing is all done by ESA they downlink the satellite the data from the satellite they produce uh, the level one, uh, a level zero products called raw. They produce the, uh, sing the level one single look complex products and they produce, uh, uh, what they call geocoded ground range detected, uh, amplitude images. Uh, all those are produced and, and provided through the Copernicus data system. Um, uh, and they process the individual bursts, uh, for the raw data and the um, single look complex data. The ground range detected images, they merge the bursts together uh, for ease of use. Uh, uh, they cut the satellite uh, data into uh, slices, uh, which are not always in the same location. That can cause confusion. Uh, for processing uh, and these data products are all uh, archived in the Copernicus data space system. It's a, a set of servers in uh, a cloud system in, in, um, in Europe, but uh, there's also a automated transfer uh, to a NASA Alaska satellite facility, distributed active archive center or DAC, um, they get all copies of all the Copernicus data, uh, Copernicus Sentinel-1 data, and they make uh, that available through the ASF. And uh, the next part of this uh, uh, webinar series will be from the uh, chief scientist of um, ASF to give more information about how they um, operate and how to search the, for the data. And they uh, have added a new uh, access system about uh, a little over a year ago now uh, to give access to the original uh, individual bursts um, it, of the single look complex images. And that's what we're going to be uh, using today. Um, but we're going to be using uh, the an, uh, an products that have had another level of processing that's been done by the NASA Opera project that's uh, running at JPL and other uh, centers, uh, where the Opera project takes those original um, SLC bursts that are in radar coordinates and co-registers them and uh, puts them into geocoded coordinates, so they're in UTM coordinates, um, and uh, they do that for all of North America. Um, and those products are archived at the ASF. So um, we'll be using that today 
to uh, save a lot of the work of getting uh, the interferograms to work. Uh, there's also another uh, NASA project called uh, ARIA. It's also at JPL where they process the uh, interferograms completely um, uh, for selected areas and selected dates uh, and, and uh, create files that are in uh, geocoded unwrapped in interferograms or GUNWs. And those are also archived at, at ASF. Um, these uh, NISAR will also, all the NISAR data will be, uh, the NISAR L band data will be archived at ASF. The uh, C band data will be archived at the ISRO data centers. Uh, I mean, the S band. Um, the um, NISAR will, uh, will be uh, producing higher level um, uh, data products that are uh, similar to what I just described are uh, from Opera. Uh, there's uh, radar coordinates wrapped interferograms uh, in the areas of ice sheets. Uh, there's geocoded single loop complex, GSLC, which is very similar to the Opera co-registered SLCs uh, from the Sentinel data. So uh, I'm going to be talking about an example with using this the Opera S1 CSLCs, but this uh, type of processing will be uh, very similar for uh, the GSLCs uh, from um, NISAR. Um, there's also uh, uh, NISAR is going to be producing these GUNWs, um, geocoded unwrapped interferographs, and those are uh, almost exactly identical to the Sentinel-1 GUNWs, um, except for the things that are specific to the different satellites. And there will also be the uh, original radar coordinates, SLCs, uh, from, available for those that want those from NISAR. Uh, I'm going to be uh, doing a demonstration using a Jupyter notebook. Um, these notebooks are available from uh, uh, GitHub on, on my account. Uh, this uh, website, uh, uh, EJ Fielding uh, RSET Notebooks, uh, and I'll be uh, running this notebook uh, to uh, show you how to use the uh, co-registered SLCs to make an interferogram uh, over the area of Hawaii. Uh, there's additional notebooks available from the Opera project um, at, the, at the Opera uh, applications website. <clears throat> so the first thing uh, we need to uh, do is find the data. Um, this is gonna be a search through the Alaska Satellite Facility. Uh, for more details on searching uh, ASF, uh, listen to part three of this uh, webinar series. Uh, uh, we'll first go to uh, ASF, uh, find the Big Island of Hawaii, uh, draw a box around it, uh, tell it that we want dates uh, uh, around the time of the, uh, an eruption that happened in 2022. This should say 2022 and not 2015. I don't know if that was a mistake. Uh, uh, we're going to choose the to the data set to to search for uh, is the Opera S1. That's the Opera uh, co-registered SLC data set. And um, when we search for that, we're gonna find the, uh, the granules uh, that uh, cover that time and, and spatial location and uh, find uh, this uh, geocoded SLC that's for one burst of the, of the scene. Uh, acquired on uh, December 12th, I mean, December 4th, 2022. And then we're uh, do the search first and then uh, do the download later with the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, this is just a, a screenshot of what we're gonna do here uh, for purposes of uh, comparison. Uh, we, uh, same thing that I just explained, we want, we're gonna, find this scene that's acquired on the uh, December 12th, 2022. 
uh, it's also possible to uh, search for the uh, GUNW ARIA Sentinel-1 GUNW interferograms at um, the ASF. So you can do the same kind of search as before um, uh, with that same um, uh, geographic box and start and end dates. Uh, but if we choose the ARIA S1 GUNW data set, then when we search, we're going to see the interferograms. And we can find a, a granule called uh, S1 GUNW track 87. Uh, Uh, tops, it's tops mode, and this gives the two dates of the that are in the interferogram. Um, the between the 11th, I mean, the 11th month, 22 second day, uh, November 22nd, and the 4th of, no, of December, uh, that's a 12 day interval uh, in 2022. Uh, we talked about uh, how to use these GUNW files last year in a, an R set training on INSAR. So uh, I'm not going to go further into that, except to show that uh, this is the uh, GUNW interferogram for the area of the uh, Mauna Loa uh, at the time of the eruption in uh, the end of November 2022. Uh, and uh, this is this is the uh, interferogram from the GUNW, uh, which has a, a 90 meter uh, spatial resolution. So this is what we see when we first open the NASA, the Alaska Satellite Facility uh, vertex or search tool. Um, and we're going to zoom in on Hawaii here. Uh, zoom. Uh, I use the scroll bar to zoom. Uh, and then I'm going to draw a box around Mauna Loa. And then I'm going to go up here. And we have a number of different things, uh, different radar data sets we can choose. Uh, but I want the Opera S1 uh, products here. Opera S1. These are the Opera products that have been um, Process by, uh, by Opera to uh, geocoded uh, co registered SLCs and also uh, geocoded uh, radiometrically terrain corrected amplitude products. I'm going to change the, um, the dates to start in uh, November 15th, 2022 and go to November, uh, December 15th, 2022, because uh, I know that the, um, the eruption happened in uh, the end of November. Uh, let's do the search. <clears throat> now we can see these are the um, Sentinel-1 scenes that were acquired at this time. Um, there's actually uh, two different tracks here. Uh, the T part of these file names in the uh, CSLCs is the um, the track number. Uh, in, in this particular case, we want the uh, track 87. And we can uh, look at track 87. Uh, this was acquired on the 4th of December, 2022. Uh, and the um, this next number in the uh, long file name 185682 is the uh, the full uh, burst number of the of that burst of the uh, sentinel data. That, so the burst numbers stay constantly in the same point on the ground. Uh, so that's why uh, they process the data uh on the on a given burst so that all the data all the scenes uh, acquired over that place on the ground are co-registered uh so and this is track 87 uh we're going to use that uh, in a minute uh with the jupiter notebook uh, so that's the uh and we can see over here it's it's an hdf5 file 
uh, that's 252 megabytes. So that's that's a pretty big file, but that's because it's um, it uh, has five meter by 10 meter resolution. It's very high resolution. Uh, so that's uh, the, the search. Uh, you can hear more about the search tomorrow, uh, next week from uh, uh, Franz Meyer uh, in, in the uh, ASF uh, search uh, webinar. Okay, so now we're going to talk about how to actually do the processing. Now that we found the uh, co-registered SLCs, uh, this same processing method uh, will work uh, with NISAR data in the future because they're basically the same product. Uh, a little unfortunate that uh, the OPER project chose a different name, but CSLCs and GSLCs are the same thing. Uh, and it's very simple because uh, the OPERA processing or the NISAR processing has done all the big amount of work of getting the two, uh, the before image, uh, or which we call the reference, and the after image, which we call the secondary, um, co-registered. Uh, that typically takes a lot of processing uh, time, uh, but they've already done that. Uh, and they've now provided this product that's already co-registered. So what all we need to do is download the uh, the reference image and the secondary image and basically uh, multiply them uh, in the complex number domain, which ends up subtracting the face. And then we immediately get an interferogram. And then it's easy to uh, take that interferogram calculate the coherence. Uh, we do some uh, multi-looking is uh, the radar uh, name for averaging pixels. Um, if we're using the uh, Sentinel-1 data, the co-registered SLCs from Sentinel-1, we have to do an additional step of merging the bursts because it's processed in separate bursts. With NISAR GSLCs, uh, we don't have to do that because it's gonna be processed on whole frames. Uh, so the the final output uh, is here. It's pretty uh, basic to get a, a what we call a, a wrapped interferogram. This is just a graphical uh, slide showing the same process. Uh, this was a slide created by uh, Grace Bato at JPL for the Opera project. Uh, these are the two uh, bursts uh, from November twenty second and December fifth or fourth, um, and uh, we multiply them in the complex. These are complex numbers, C1 and C2. Uh, that's how we actually do the calculation of the, the phase difference. Uh, I'll go into uh, why that complex number works, but uh, then we immediately uh, get the interferogram for that one burst of, over the area of the of, of Mauna Loa, and then we can calculate the coherence. And then uh, after we uh, merge uh, three bursts together, uh, we're going to use these three bursts from track 82. Uh, we can get uh, the full area of uh, surface deformation uh, from the, uh, the 2022 eruption uh, of Mauna Loa and uh, this map on the right is the coherence map. Uh, and the, the, this area near the top of Mauna Loa where we see the sharp uh, area of, uh, of uh, low coherence, and that's the area where the lava flows have uh, completely changed the surface. And uh, it's an excellent way to map the uh, the new lava flows uh, as of the date uh, of uh, December 4th, when the uh, image, the second image was acquired. So uh, that will go back and now and do this same uh, processing in uh, the Jupyter Notebook that uh, Grace Bato uh, created uh, to do this uh, calculation uh, with a, a few changes that I made. And uh, that notebook is available from um, GitHub. Um, 
So uh, this is a notebook. Uh, we don't have time to go through uh, the whole explanation of how to run Jupyter Notebooks. That's been covered in other uh, courses. This is a notebook that was originally uh, created by uh, Grace Botto at JPL uh, that I modified to be uh, with some more annotation uh, about uh, for this training course. Uh, so uh, just going to jump into it uh, here. This is the uh, explanation. We're using the Opera co-registered SLCs with the uh, 10 meter resolution in the uh, north-south direction or northern direction, five meter resolution in the um, east-west direction. It's already in uh, UTM coordinates and uh, the co-registered SLCs have been processed. So they're all uh, co-registered. Uh, this is uh, a way of setting up the condo environment. I'm not going to go into that in detail. Uh, we'll just uh, skip over that. Uh, load the necessary modules here. Um, set up the this next step is where we uh, define the uh, parameters for the area of interest that we want to study. Uh, this is a bounding box for the area of Mauna Loa. It's uh, 155 degrees longitude west, 19 uh, degrees north, uh, with some uh, decimal points there. Uh, the orbital pass is descending, where the satellite's moving southward. The path is 87. Uh, we're going to use a reference date of um, the 22nd of November and a secondary date of the 4th of uh, December, and uh, I'm going to put this output files into a directory on my uh, Macintosh called user fielding downloads and save it into a directory called Mauna Loa demo uh, uh, track 87. Uh, you have to set up your Earth data login. Uh, this cell will ask you for your login information if you haven't already set up a a netrc file uh, that's a special file in your home directory that it's called uh, underscore netrc if you're running windows and um, dot netrc if you run uh, linux or uh, mac os uh, it, this checks to see if you already have that file if you do then it grabs the uh, your login information from the file if you don't then this other steps uh, ask you for the your earth data login and then uh, puts it into that file for you uh, this next step uh, actually queries the uh, asf uh, dac uh, using a, a module called asf search that was part of the set of modules uh, uh, loaded by that conda command uh, before we're looking for the opera s1 slc's same thing that we search for in the gui we want the CSLC processing level, and then with that area of interest, uh, the past direction, start date, end date. And we can see that it found uh, six, uh, uh, six bursts. Uh, we can, this next step uh, loads those bursts into a geo data frame to better uh, look at the metadata about the bursts. And this next one, uh, selects just the bursts uh, from the um, reference scene and the uh, secondary scene in case we uh, had uh, a longer time interval that included more than just two dates. Um, this uh, this does a, a sub -select, subset selection. We now end up with the, we still have six bursts. Uh, there's three different bursts and two different dates for each of those bursts. So it's a total of six bursts. And this next plot uh, page would does a, uh, makes a map using that, uh, uh, that information. And we can see here that those bursts cover uh, the Western part of central uh, uh, part of the big island where the uh, peak of Mauna Loa is. You wanna make sure that the bursts uh, cover the area that you want to cover. Um, so that was just done by searching for the, the bursts. Uh, this next step actually downloads the data. Uh, because I ran this before, it, uh, it doesn't bother to download them again. 
uh, but it, it's it's relatively quick if you have a good uh, internet connection. They're 250 megabytes a piece, much smaller than the original um, uh, full SLC slices. Uh, then we uh, read uh, each one of these bursts and uh, uh, calculate the um, which bursts uh, are from which dates. Uh, this step actually opens the files and uh, checks to make sure what's uh, the, what's in them. Uh, it's got the first, okay, now we got all, all three, all six of the bursts open. The next step is just to calculate the interferograms. Uh, we're ready to uh, take these, these functions here, calculate the uh, interferograms and do the uh, multi-looking that I mentioned and then uh, write the files to uh, uh, geotests. And that, so this next command uh, actually does, goes through uh, for each one of the bursts and finds the reference SLC and the secondary SLC, does that subtraction, calculates the interferogram, calculates the coherence, and then uh, we'll, we'll be able to see those images. Okay, there's three different bursts. And it's going to make some plots. There's the, uh, the northernmost burst, which is mostly north of where the volcano is, uh, where the volcanic deformation is. Uh, this is the coherence for that burst. This is the middle burst uh, we were most of the, where the peak of Mauna Loa is. And this is the coherence for that burst. This is the southern burst uh, and the coherence for that burst. And then the, um, the next step actually uh, merges the bursts. Uh, oh, that's, that's the, the function definition. This, is, this one actually runs the bursts. So the first first cell merges the interferograms. The second one merges the uh, coherence files. Uh, and here's the uh, final results. We have the, uh, oh, and now it's still running the merge. Uh, this part can take uh, a fair amount of memory on your computer, uh, so it could take longer or shorter depending on, on your computer. This is the uh, merged interferogram. It's still, it's a wrapped interferogram. Uh, this is Sentinel-1, uh, which has the uh, C-band uh, 5.6 uh, centimeter radar wavelength. So each one of these fringes is 2.8 centimeters, half the radar wavelength. Uh, and uh, we can uh, count how many uh, fringes there are to calculate what's the total deformation. Uh, the next step for a more advanced analysis would be to unwrap these fringes. Uh, we, in this uh, very preliminary uh, course, we're not going to be covering the uh, phase unwrapping part, which can be uh, uh, more difficult and uh, require some more expertise. Uh, and and uh, so today we're just going to talk about the, um, the, the interferogram and this coherence map. This coherence map, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the dark areas here near the top of Mauna Loa are the areas where the lava flows have, have completely covered the surface. Um, and uh, we can see that the, the this is the peak of Mauna Loa. Uh, the lava flows both went to the north and to the south. Uh, this flow that went to the north actually was in danger of hitting a road that's further down down the hill here. Um, and so it was very uh, important to have this kind of radar information to know how far the lava flow was getting. Um, Although once it got close to the road, they could actually see it from the road and uh, know where it was. But uh, this also, uh, because the radar covers the whole part of Mauna Loa, we could also see that some of these lava flows went south from the, the main um, 
the main caldera of, of Mauna Loa and uh, the, but they did not go very far to the south. Um, the, one of the initial concerns after this eruption started was how far to the south some of these lava flows could get. And uh, this confirmed that the, the lava flows did not go very far to the south. Uh, so um, that's the uh, very basic notebook that shows how we can use these co-registered SLCs to make uh, interferograms and coherence maps or correlation maps from the, uh, the data for this uh, Hawaiian uh, volcanic eruption in 2022. Uh, this is uh, a QGIS uh, function. Uh, because these uh, interferograms and coherence maps were saved as geotiffs, I could uh, open them directly in QGIS. QGIS knows uh, uh, where they are from the uh, geotiff information. Uh, I previously loaded uh, the um, Google satellite uh, image so we can see um, the uh, context for the uh, interferogram. This is the uh, high peak of, of Mauna Loa. Uh, we can also look at the coherence map. One of the interesting things here uh, about, is that we can also see uh, the areas that are green on the uh, satellite image where there's the, the more forested parts of Mauna Loa at lower elevations, those are uh, low coherence. Um, and as we expected from the uh, coherence discussion that I did earlier, uh, so the, the low coherence at the low elevations is due to uh, vegetation. The low coherence at the high elevations in uh, Mauna Loa, where there's no trees, uh, is due to the lava flows that covered the surface and completely changed the radar uh, backscatter. So, this uh, one image shows uh, the, the two biggest effects on coherence uh, in one image. Uh, and so uh, we can you know, turn the, the coherence on and off and see. Uh, you can also see in, in, in a couple of places where there were lava flows from, I think, uh, uh, in the, I think this was uh, maybe 100 years ago. Uh, a lava flow came down here into the Kona area, um, and that there's no trees along that lava flow, and you can see that the coherence is actually high along that old lava flow because there's no trees on it. Whereas the new lava flow, um, we can tell from the older lava flows because the coherence has dropped. And so that's the um, a, a quick overview of how to uh, interpret uh, the interferograms and the um, the coherence maps for a volcanic eruption. Uh, similar types of analysis could be done for uh, earthquakes, landslides, and other processes that um, modify the land surface. This is a summary of what we covered today. Um, the INSAR theory, uh, the key point is that the INSAR uh, uses the phase of the reflected radar signal to measure the distance from the satellite to the ground or the ground to the satellite with very high precision. Uh, the coherence of, or correlation, local correlation of the INSAR phase is a sensitive measure of what the house the surface or surface cover, I mean, which could include vegetation, how stable that surface or surface cover is at the radar wavelength scale, uh, we could uh, the phase cycles in in these repeat pass wrapped interferograms show the change in distance that's uh, proportional to uh, the half the radar wavelength for Sentinel One and other uh, C band satellites. That's about 2.8 centimeters. For NISAR, uh, that uh, half wavelength is will be 12 centimeters. Um, so NISAR will be less, somewhat less sensitive, but it will have much better coherence in vegetated areas. Uh, these newly pre-processed uh, INSAR products uh, from Opera, uh, the co-registered SLCs and uh, GONWs um, 
enable uh, analysis with a few additional steps. Uh, the same thing will be true for NISAR, where we'll have the GSLCs and uh, GUNWs. Um, so uh, the demonstration today showed uh, how we can just with a few uh, commands in Python be able to make an interferogram out of these uh, pre-processed products. Uh, these INSAR measurements are useful for a wide variety of uh, uh, processes on the earth uh, and above the earth that uh, cause uh, motion of the surface or, or surface uh, materials, uh, including uh, earthquakes, landslides, uh, volcanic eruptions, uh, also some hydrologic processes such as um, groundwater extraction, the all dynamics of glaciers, the, the rate of glacier motion, and uh, several other effects that cause the uh, surface or, or large structures such as bridges or dams uh, to move. So I'm going to uh, pass this back to uh, Erica uh, for the final uh, wrap up and questions. So thank you very much, Dr. Fielding, for that great presentation and demo. Now, I'd like to remind everyone that there is a homework associated with the uh, webinar series. The homework will open on the last day of the webinar series. That's next Wednesday, November 20th. The due date is December 4th. And a certificate of completion will be given to participants who attend all three live sessions complete the homework by the due date, and they will receive a certificate via email approximately two months after completion of the course. And if you have any questions about the material that was presented today, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Eric Fielding through his email posted here. Once again, thank you to Dr. Fielding for the presentation and the demo, and a special thanks to Grace Bato for putting together the Jupyter Notebook. Also, thank you to all the participants for um, your interest and your questions. We've been assembling them into a Google Doc, which we will share with you shortly on screen. And now we will begin our question and answer session. Wonderful. So uh, let's, uh, we've had a, a number of uh, questions and let's start uh, in the interest of time uh, and we'll try to get as through as many as we can. Uh, Dr. Feeling has already started answering some of these questions. Uh, let's just start from the top. Um, can we import and analyze INSAR data in Google Earth Engine? Dr. Feeling, please go ahead. Yes. Um... Google Earth Engine I, has the capability to import uh, GeoTIFF images. So if you do your INSAR analysis with whatever package and save your says a GeoTIFF, then you can load them into Google Earth Engine or another uh, GIS system such as ArcGIS or QGIS. G Google Earth Engine cannot uh, be used to do INSAR calculations because it does not support uh, complex radar um, phase data. Thank you. Question number two, can we do interferometry using any SAR mode, scan, strip, spot, for example? Uh, yes, in, in some cases, uh, uh, yes, we can do uh, interferometry with uh, the different uh, SAR modes. Uh, the Strip map data is always compatible for interferometry as long as it's uh, data acquired on the same track with an adequate baseline. Uh, it's a very simple uh, SAR mode. Scan SAR and, and the Sentinel-1 TOPS mode SAR data has to be acquired uh, with the bursts of the scan SAR um, precisely co uh, synchronized in space. Uh, to enable interferometry. The Sentinel-1 satellite is uh, specifically designed to do this. Uh, so that's uh, uh, 
a type of uh, Scansar system. Other Scansar systems, uh, such as ALOS 2, are also designed for INSAR. In Spotlight mode uh, is more difficult. It has to be acquired with exactly the same imaging geometry of two passes, and that is possible, but it's uh, not always done. Okay, question number three, is it possible to mix the modes? Uh, in some cases, it is possible to do INSAR analysis by mixing uh, strip map and ScanSAR data. Uh, including the ALOS-2 satellite. Uh, the ICE-2 application called ALOS-2 app that was written by a, a stock working with me at uh, JPL supports uh, this mixed mode INSAR between the ALOS-2 strip map and ScanSAR data. I don't think it's possible with of other satellites. Great, thank you. Question number four. Between cross-track interferometry and a long-track interferometry, which is better and for what type of situation? So they measure different things. Cross-track interferometry measures topography, the height of the ground land surface. A long-track interferometry uh, measures ocean wave motion. So they're very different measurements. Okay, question number five. Can you please brief about colorization of SAR image? I, I think these are false color composites. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I wasn't quite sure what this uh, question was asking. One mm -hmm. of the ways that we often uh, portray the uh, wrapped phase for interferograms is with a rainbow uh, color scheme that uh, just cycles through the rainbow so that uh, the uh, every time it goes through uh, the the two pi uh, phase variation, it reaches the same color uh, in the rainbow. That's uh, uh, one of the ways that, that uh, INSAR is colored. I'm not okay. sure if that's what they were asking. Yeah, um, in terms of amplitude, I can also add a link to a, a guide on how to best portray uh, different polarization images. Mm -hmm. So, a uh, question, go ahead, please. No, go ahead. Okay, question number six. How is the Copernicus DM different from the SRTM DM? Is the DM generated actually as a digital surface model and SRTM digital elevation model? Please explain. Yes, uh, actually both um, Copernicus DEM and SRTM are digital surface models. Uh, the Copernicus DEM is derived from the Tandem X satellites. Uh, so it's using X-band three centimeter wavelength radar and the SRTM was uh, acquired with uh, the C-band radar, a six centimeter radar wavelength. So they are both uh, measuring uh, the surface, uh, included in in forested areas. Uh, they are going to be measuring a, a different height within the uh, forested areas uh, because the radar, the X-band, will be reflecting higher in the in the radar canopy and the c band somewhat uh deeper into the forest but neither one of them is imaging the ground underneath the forest great question number seven can insar be used to measure the surface roughness of water such as in detecting variations in water surface texture or wave height no insar phase cannot measure surface roughness of water there are radar systems that can measure water waves by looking at the radar backscatter amplitude. And this is a, a very common technique used in a number of satellites. But it's using the amplitude of the radar rather than the phase. Okay, question number eight. Can we map topographic change by uh, using free data? And which one should we use? 
The SRTM data was acquired in February of 2000, and the Copernicus DEM was, acquired, was based on um, Tandem X data acquired between 2015 and 2017. They're both free and uh, can be used to measure topographic change between those two times. Um, there's no other present source of, uh, of data from, from radar satellites, but there are other, some countries have free topographic data that can be used to measure uh, change mm -hmm. at, uh, with, with other uh, topographic measurement methods. Okay, question number nine. Has NASA or other space Earth uh, remote sensing groups ever proposed attaching radar at the radar antenna to commercial flights to collect high resolution data regularly? Uh, synthetic aperture radar uh, from airplanes requires a special design of the airplane. It cannot just be done from any airplane. So it, there's it's uh, not possible to just connect it to any commercial airplane. Question 10, what is the minimum size deformation detectable using Sentinel-1 satellites? The spatial size uh, of INSAR, the uh, measurements that Sentinel can measure is about 20 by 20 meters if you have a high coherence. Um, the displacement magnitude that can be detected in a single interferon is around five millimeters. But measurements of one millimeter are possible if you can add many interferograms over a long time interval to measure uh, a, a smaller uh, displacement. Uh, but we have to pay attention to the fact that atmospheric noise can be one to five centimeters and sometimes even higher. So the accuracy of the measurement will be much uh, lower uh, if the atmosphere is active during the uh, star acquisitions. Great. Question number 11. Does ice-eye radar work on the same star interferometry principle? How would an ice-eye image be converted to a DEM for input into a GIS, for example? Most ISI data is acquired uh, with single passes, not in a, an INSAR compatible geometry that uh, repeats the same pass exactly on uh, two different orbits. Mm -hmm. They are starting to acquire more data with orbits that are close enough together for INSAR. Um, you would have to get uh, two images acquired with the, the right uh, in, in SAR geometry to make a DEM. All right, question number 13. If we're able to monitor crops with SAR, then you when skipped. we try, oh, go ahead. You skipped question 12. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, question 12. In SAR data from Sentinel 1 only available, please specify how to access the data. Uh, the availability of Sentinel-1 data will be covered more in more detail next week in part three of this series, but it, it is generally available from the uh, Copernicus data space system in Europe and the uh, NASA Alaska satellite facility. Okay, great. Thank you. So now question number 13, if, we're, if we are able to monitor crops with SAR, then when we try to build the topography within SAR, does that mean we may end up getting signal from the plants instead of the ground surface? And is it possible to separate these signals? Yeah, I'm not quite sure whether they were asking about doing um, 
DMs with Insar uh, uh, where we would want to have two images acquired with the same geometry uh, at the same time using cross track interferometry, doing Insar in an area where there's crops. Um, so I think it's the second question. Um, INSAR measurements are affected by crops if the the uh, crops have uh, dense leaves and vegetation, then that will cause a, a loss of coherence for the short wavelength INSAR satellites, such as Sentinel-1, other C-band satellites or X-band satellites. The L-band radar of NISAR and, and other L-band satellites will largely go through the, the crop vegetation and enable INSAR measurements of the ground surface below. Great. Question number 14. Can you share resources to pre-process SAR imagery using the SNAP toolbox and also Python? Uh, the uh, ESA STEP forum uh, with the link here has a, uh, is a great source of information about using the SNAP software and their um, Python uh, SNAP PY uh, code. That's a, a, the best place I would start. Great. Question 15. How accurate is detection of change in terms of meters or centimeters in case I want to detect height change of a building or want to do volumetric calculation in my area? If a building is under construction and uh, they're actually adding floors to the building, then it will be changing the radar reflections and then become incoherent for INSAR. We can't measure the height of uh, uh, the height change of a building with uh, repeat pass interferometry, only single pass across cross track in interferometric topographic maps could be used to measure building height changes. Okay, the next question, number 16, what do you mean by displacement sensitivity? Uh, this is the how sensitive we are to uh, displacement on the ground. Uh, we can see uh, around half a centimeter of displacement of the ground surface uh, using INSAR with a, a C-band radar satellite. All right, question 17. Discuss the difference between DINSAR and, uh, and uh, PS, so polarimetric synthetic, uh, uh, PS INSAR? I'm not sure. Yeah. This is a, an advanced topic, uh, so I can't go into all the details. Oh. The, mm -hmm. the basic detail the difference is that uh, D INSAR. Distributed scatterer INSAR has averaged uh, some number of pixels to measure the phase and displacement over an area of 5 to 20 or more pixels. The PS INSAR, or persistent scatterer INSAR method, finds special pixels that have stable phase and amplitude and measure the displacements of those limited number of pixels. Great. Thank you. Question 18, how do different phase unwrapping algorithms perform in areas with steep topography or discontinuities? And what are the trade-offs between computational efficiency and accuracy? Uh, this is a really advanced topic. Um, we uh, have, uh, a lot of people have been working on this for many years, and I think it's too hard to explain here. Okay, May, maybe something to elaborate um, in, in the uh, when uh, typing out the answer then. Uh, question number 19, what are the limitations of 2 pi phase ambiguity resolution when dealing with temporal decorrelation in multi-temporal INSAR applications? Yeah, this is a, an important limitation of phase unwrapping or, or phase ambiguity resolution. The phase uh, ambiguity cannot be accurately calculated if the coherence is too low or the area is decorrelated. 
Um, and the, the next question is very similar. Um, the, it would, uh, there are some approaches people use. The main approach is to average more pixels. Um, to uh, to try to extract a, a, a phase over a larger area. Uh, if there's no if there's no information in the phase, then it's it's impossible. It depend that's when the the coherence is effectively zero. Great. Then the next question number twenty one. How can we process INSAR images for time series land displacement? Please share how to process. Uh, we uh, covered this in some previous uh, set tutorials, how to do the time series analysis uh, uh, in uh, 2022 and 2023. So uh, that would I recommend people go back to those previous training sessions. All right, question, uh, we'll put the link to that here. The next question, number 22, beside ice motion, is it possible to measure ice thickness and roughness? Uh, the ice roughness is uh, similar to uh, the water roughness. It can be measured by looking at the radar backscatter amplitude, not the uh, radar phase. Um, the ice thickness uh, uh, can be uh, measured only with the uh, single pass interferometry, where we have two images acquired simultaneously with cross track interferometry. Okay, then the next question, number 23, what is the major difference between SAR and INSAR applications? Uh, the INSAR is uh, for measuring uh, the displacement of the ground surface or disruptions of the ground surface that affect the radar phase. Uh, other SAR applications, uh, learn uh, can use the amplitude of the radar and the uh, variation with different polarizations to learn about uh, uh, vegetation structure, soil moisture, and other effects. Okay, question number 24, pretty uh, multi-tiered question here. What is the common spatial framework that these systems are coordinated against? That's to know where the observation platform is and how is it orientated, oriented in relation to the object in the surface and what coordinated framework is used. I think you mentioned that satellite themselves would have advanced systems to measure the difference between the antenna, but the position of the platform in relation to the DM. The modern uh, recent SAR satellites, including Sentinel-1 and, and NISAR and, and others, have onboard GNSS receivers to determine the platform position and, uh, and uh, other uh, sensors to measure the attitude, orientation. So, uh, the, then the satellite orbit is estimated from the uh, GNSS data in a, and estimated in a standard terrestrial reference frame as it in uh, the operations of the satellites. Great. So um, we'll go through another two questions in the interest of time. Uh, question 25, how can we be sure if our analysis is true or accurate? How do we make sure the analysis is not affected by noise or some kind of ground survey uh, should be done to validate the analysis? Uh, this is a good question. Uh, the uh, now, uh, it's our 
Hopefully it would be done with a time series to so that we have more than one interferogram to uh, reduce the uh, effects of the atmosphere that's changing rapidly and causing uh, the atmospheric noise. So ground measurements are always helpful to validate the analysis. Great. Uh, the next question, how can INSAR be used to monitor ground acceleration in case of a seismic activity? Uh, I, I don't think the uh, question is about how, how actually measuring the acceleration of the ground during the seismic uh, earthquake shaking, and INSAR cannot measure that. We can only measure the static dis total displacement. Uh, caused by an earthquake, not the acceleration of the ground acceleration or ground velocity during the earthquake. Okay, question number 27. How do the colors in interferometry, I guess in an interferogram, translate to physical distance of displacement? Is it possible to measure the actual displacement from the colors? Uh, generally, you can get some rough estimate, but uh, you want to get the original interferogram to uh, really know, uh, measure the actual displacement. Okay, the next question, uh, number 28. I'd like to inquire the about the position of horizontal and vertical deformation measurements in relation to volcanic eruption predictions. Specifically, is there a definitive deformation threshold that reliably indicates an imminent eruption, say within a couple of days? No, I don't. Uh, this will be, uh, there's no uh, threshold uh, that can be applied everywhere. Uh, local uh, volcanic observatories are the ones that uh, know how a specific volcano is likely to uh, behave and would would need to uh, be involved in in interpreting the the exact depth threshold that uh, means that an Im eruption is in a minute. And generally, it's the seismic data of for a volcano that tells the most information about exactly when eruption is about to start. Okay, and then the last, we'll end that question number 30. So number 29, can SAR data be used to pick up any patterns to predict earthquakes? In Japan, they're expecting a mega quake in Nankai in the near future. Can SAR data help to take countermeasures in such a scenario? We don't have any uh, accurate precursor uh, measurements to tell when an earthquake is about to happen in the near future. So INSAR and GNSS data are both measuring the surface displacements, but there's no uh, definitive measure uh, to determine when an earthquake is about to happen. Okay, and now then last question, how do you determine displacement size of 1.2 with reference to the Nepal earthquake? I guess this is from the example that you showed. Uh, and did the analysis to in the radar line of sight and it moved 1.2 meters in the radar uh, line of sight after um, unwrapping the INSAR phase uh, and uh, estimating the displacement. Okay, so with that, we're a little a couple of minutes um, over, but uh, let's just end it there and we will answer all of the questions and place the Google Doc on the training webpage. Um, we have received a lot of questions, so thank you for uh, um, all of your interest and questions coming in. I would like to thank Dr. Eric Fielding, 
um, for the excellent material um, today. I'd like to thank Dr. Grace Bato for her support, and I'd like to thank the RSET team for um, the, all, all of the support and putting this together. Before I close, I'd like to um, have uh, Dr. Fielding give some um, closing words. Please go ahead. Yes, we are um, at JPL. We're greatly looking forward to the launch of the NISAR satellite in in a few months. Uh, we'll be able to do INSAR over the vegetated parts of the world that are not presently uh, accessible to doing good INSAR measurements. And uh, that's our, our goal in the short term at JPL to get the NISAR satellite launched and in operations uh, sometime uh, during 2025. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Fielding. Very exciting times with the upcoming launch of NISAR. So uh, with that, then uh, we'll close this session. Please remember there is one last session as part of this series. It will be next Wednesday at the same time. And it will be focused on a different SAR data that's available through the Alaska Satellite Facility and resources for analyzing and visualizing data. So with that, wishing you all a great rest of your day and until next week. Bye-bye, everyone.